Hi, everyone. Welcome to Liticast. We are joined today by Colin Levy, uh, who is a legal tech influencer. You may have seen him on Twitter. You may have seen him on LinkedIn, where actually um, I ran into him originally. Uh, we're also joined by Rachel Rosenthal, the product manager at Litify for Docrio, our document generation and management product. Um, very grateful, Colin, for you to be joining us here today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, so when uh, I ran into your LinkedIn post, I think it was about a month ago, and um, it was short. I think it was two sentences. And you were you you just said that the one of the biggest under leveraged pieces of information that an attorney has is the data from their documents, right? I reached out to you. We had a conversation about that. Um, and I, I thought it would be great for us to get on a Liticast and really talk about um, what are the types of documents that attorneys have at their disposal? What do they do with those documents? How do they get them into a system um, that actually can kind of catalog all of that data? And then once you have that information, what do you actually do with it? Um, and that's what we are here to talk about today. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, no, it's great. Um, you want to give us a little bit of background on, on who you are and, uh, and your background, your experience, your skill set? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, again, thanks for having me. Uh, really excited to be here. Uh, I have been a in-house attorney now uh, for uh, a number of years, uh, having worked in a large, in a wide range of different companies, from a legal startup company to a global manufacturing company to a global learning company, and then most recently um, with a growing tech company on the software service space, where I was their sole in-house counsel. Uh, and through all those experiences, I really kind of got to really understand what it meant to be an in-house attorney, what it meant to be a business partner, a resource for different functions, and frankly, got to understand how technology and innovation can play a really big role in helping kind of make the in-house lawyer's job easier, make them more responsive, more efficient, and more productive in their role. And perhaps most importantly, allow them to bring more value to their role and to their department. Um, and one of those areas certainly is in deriving um, actionable insights from the data contained within documents that you deal with on a daily basis. Yeah, no, that's that's great. And um, for, for those who don't know and don't follow Colin, um, he is a, a great resource, um, would be a great asset to any team, to any organization. Um, you went through, um, some layoffs through the COVID pandemic, right? Um, and currently looking for, for a new opportunity. Indeed, indeed. Um, yep, and uh, you know, I've, I've been through a lot of different legal markets, uh, legal employment markets. This is definitely a little bit of an unusual one, but, uh, but you know, it is, it is what it is. No one was expecting a pandemic. Uh, so here we, uh, here we are. And I should also mention that um, one of the reasons why um, I got really into tech was through not just my work, but through writing a blog about um, legal innovation and legal technology and kind of talking with a lot of folks who are, who have been doing this work for far longer than I have. And, and a lot of what they have done have inspired me to be more involved and be more outspoken on these issues. Uh, and I welcome you to uh, check out my blog at colonistlovey.com. Yes. Uh, no, you, you do write some great stuff. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, anyone who's watching today should be following you on LinkedIn, following you on Twitter, because you, you do have an interesting slant on legal technology and provide some great insights. Um, so let's talk about what we're here to, to talk about today, right? When, when I saw your post, you know, there, it was implied that there is a lot of data and things that you should be doing with the data from your documents. But I think we need to start really at the beginning, which is how do you actually take the documents that you have today and get them into a system so that you can actually do something with it, you know, run reports and then later, right, comes machine learning or artificial intelligence or automation. But let's start right at the beginning. Um, Colin, how do you recommend um, organizations or, or attorneys get the documents that they have today into a structured system? Sure, so structure is an interesting word. I think what's important to understand about your documents is um, 
all that data that are in your documents are in what's called unstructured format, meaning that they're just there's just bits and pieces of data all over the place. And it's really hard to organize all those different bits of data like uh, renewal dates or payment terms or things like that, which by themselves are structured pieces of, pieces of data, but within a larger contract, contract is organized because it's a, it's a contract, so there are certain ways it's organized. But from a data derivation kind of perspective, it's unstructured, so you need to structure it first. And the, one of the really good ways to do that is by implementing some form of a contract management system, which then can help you organize your, your documents and your contracts, and then take out or derive those different bits of data, like the renewal dates, like the payment terms, like um, termination obligations and things like that. And then you can get data from, from, from that system. But first you have to understand that you need to put in place a way to structure that data. And one of the best ways, like you said, is a contract management system for contracts. And so, so taking the documents themselves and, and digitizing them, so to speak, right? Just scanning as a PDF, it gets the actual file, the visual into the system, but, and maybe Rachel, you can comment on this because this is what you live on a, on a daily basis. How do you actually take the document file that you have then put into the contract management system and extract um, the actual text out? Yeah, for sure. So with um, Docrio, the product that I work on primarily, we have OCR in place, which is um, you know technology that takes that document when it gets uploaded into the system, and it takes all of the text out of the document and creates a text layer and is stored within the system so that you can search upon that text. So typical, typical document management systems, contract management systems allow you to search on file name or a couple of file properties that you've been able to capture within the system. But with OCR, you can now search the actual text layer within that document. And that and that searching can be really powerful because one of the, you know, probably one thing that took me a lot of time to deal with often was finding a clause that I've used in a prior agreement that was really effective because it was a compromise provision and it came up all the time during the course of negotiations was finding that language and being able to use it again. And if you can search your documents quickly and easily, that task gets a lot easier and a lot quicker. And that in turn speeds up your response time to move a certain transaction floor, which is really important when you're uh, working in a company as in-house counsel and trying to help move the business along. Colin, how, how would you recommend, let's say an organization has their actual documents digitized. They have used OCR. How do you recommend they take that raw text and actually get it structured in a way, you know, we use a technical term here, right? Actually leveraging metadata to, to take bits of that document and, and say, you know, for instance, there's a specific date, right? Contract termination date should live in this field. So you're not really just, you know, searching through raw text, but you're searching for that specific field's text. Yeah, so it's really important to make sure that the data you have when you're using some form of contract management system is interpreting certain types of data the same way. Meaning that when it sees like a renewal date, it classifies that as, all right, this is a renewal term and therefore that date is is within this field and therefore you can see, all right, I have this number of contracts that are renewing on this time or this number of contracts that um, have payments due within you know 30 days or 15 days or what have you. So that's something that's really important to be able to classify that category. And that is a really important step and a really powerful element of having a contract management system in place is being able to be able to classify data that way and therefore make it more actionable because you then you see, all right, I've got X number of contracts that all deal with the same thing and here's the way they've all dealt with it. How, how do you see this information getting embedded into a more robust um, knowledge management system? So, well, let me ask, let me, let me flip the question back to you a little bit in terms, <laughs> in terms of knowledge management. Sure. Yeah. In term, because you have to be sort of, I think, specific with regards to what you're talking about in terms of acknowledgement system. So, what do you, in terms of you know how you're envisioning it? What do you, what do you mean by that? I guess is my question. So, if if you're working on a case, right, and you're, and I'm trying to agnosticize this as much as possible for our audience, but you have a, uh, you have a, a way of of identifying um, previous cases that your your firm has worked on that are related to a specific 
you know, a specific type of case or a specific outcome, and you don't, you want to identify aspects of um, of these cases or identify conflicts, right? You're using some sort of system to search through that today. It lives in a practice management system, or it lives in Salesforce, or it lives in um, in whatever system you wind up leveraging at your firm or in your your company. How do you take the data from your documents and um, and add that data to the data that you already have in your existing systems? Yeah, so well, one important way I think you can do that is um, you want, really want to look at integrations in terms of how your contract management system works with these other tools that you have. Because um, a lot of us use Salesforce or we use DocuSign to execute agreements or um, use Office or what have you. Um, and so a lot of these contract management tools and frankly other document management tools offer these types of integrations so that it's so that this tool is but one in what's what you could call your tech stack and works really well with your other systems seamlessly so that you have everything all aligned in the same way and all the systems are communicating with one another because I do think that's a really important consideration when you're looking at tools is to make sure that they're all talking to one another because if you have you know, two or three different systems, but they don't talk to one another, it doesn't really matter how great they are, what they do, because you're still having to do the manual work of making sure that they all are telling you the exact same thing, which is the whole point of having these systems in the first place. Yeah, Rachel, you and I mm -hmm. were speaking this morning about this, right? Um, combining document data with matter information or contact yep. information. Um, can you talk about how, how how you've seen this happen, right? Combining the information from the documents through you know, uh, people who are leveraging a Salesforce or system like Litify or another practice management platform and how they're combining that data. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, with the way that we have Docrio and it's so tightly integrated with um, Salesforce as is out of the box, it makes it so that the document is built off of that data that you have natively, which is what we talked about, and then leveraging, you know, the OCR, technology and then you know some of our upcoming features you'll be able to get the doc the data out of the document that was given to you and living within salesforce next to your already existing data so you can have those two things together and build your native reporting and you know make those judgment calls and those comparisons and contrasts and be able to have all of the data at your fingertips in the same system to Colin's point of having things tightly integrated together. So, you know, being able, to, again, to take the existing data you already have and then leverage OCR and DocRio to get the new data into the system. Yeah, and that reporting element is is really important yeah. too because it's one thing to have a system that organizes all the data, but you really want to be able to, but to really act on that data, you need to get reports and, the, and, and you need to, in order to get accurate reports, you need to make sure everything is aligned together. So that's that's a really important element. How Absolutely. about getting you know, there's um, this daunting task of, of organizations that have all their existing documents, getting them into a system. And then there's the ongoing task of every time new documents come in from external sources, taking those, ingesting them, and then not only storing them, but actually putting them in the right place where they're supposed to go. Um, Rachel, can you talk about how we how you've tackled that problem? Yes, absolutely. We created something called DocaSign, which um, is a super convenient um, integrated app that lives on your computer. And what you do is you have your document digitized some way, whether it you know arrived electronically to you already, or you made it electronic using a scanner program or something, and you just put your file into that folder on your computer, and then we sync it right up to DocRio. And through DocRio and Salesforce, you can assign it to the correct matter. Um, it's super easy. It takes seconds and it's barely any effort on your part. You just have to save a file to a folder, which is part of your normal everyday behavior anyways. Um, and you can even set your scanner up so that it scans directly to that folder as well. And the person never has to interact with the file whatsoever till it's already in the system. Um, and, and so it's, I, sorry, I just, go ahead, Colin. Oh, I was just going to add that I think that that kind of thing is really can be very powerful because it takes sort of that one element of your workflow out of your hands mm -hmm. that you don't have to deal with. And I know a lot of lawyers, um, there are a lot of elements to their workflows and any individual element that you can take out makes their life easier. It makes them be able to be more responsive and more proactive because they don't have to worry about that added step that needs to happen. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's almost like the, uh, the mail cart 
has been yep. left behind in the dust, right? We jokingly called it the mailroom app um, mm -hmm. when it was being developed because l literally the, the document comes in, it gets scanned, and then the system takes it and puts it somewhere where someone just has to say what matter is this related to. Yep. It's a very different process. So some secondary benefits here of, um, of going through the document digitization process in order to develop insights out of your documents data are actually um, improving your operational efficiency, right? Things that used to be done by people, which has room for you know margin of error, um, you know those things are now just kind of a thing of the past and um, allow you to get your documents into the system quicker and um, associated with the correct matter. Yep, absolutely. So I, I think that there's there's a couple things that you can do once you actually have the data accessible, right? There's the automation that you build because you know that there are certain things that you need to do once you have this information. Um, maybe three things, because we also talked about searching, right? Finding specific, um, searching for specific pieces of data from your documents. So automation, searching, and then um, the future, right? Letting the computer do the work for you, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Let's start with, um, let's start with automation. Let's talk about some of the things that you can do, Colin, once you actually have the data that exists in in alongside all the rest of your data, what can you do with it? Yeah, so there's a lot of different things that can be automated and can make your life easier. I'm going along with the contracts management or contract example that I've uh, been using. Uh, for example, one way would be, you know, you've got a contract and it has this one provision that is always a problem for you and there and you know you have this go-to compromise that you use. Well, you, with a lot of systems, what you can do now is you can say, hey, you know that clause I used before, let's use that one here. And with the click of a button, it could be inserted into your agreement and then it could be automatically sent off and the other side can look at it and respond accordingly. So that's one way that automation can really help. Another way is suppose you have, you know, a contract and it's got, you know, just, and you have to fill in your company information and the agreement. And the problem is, you know, not only is it to fill it in this one agreement, you have to fill it in with this associated agreement and this appendix and all of this other things. These tools can help you fill in all that information with one click so you don't have to do that. And I know um, as much as all lawyers love to input their company information into like a million NDAs and a million of other types of associated documents, uh, these tools can help automate that kind of annoying step. So that's another thing that can be automated. Um, and I would say a third area is even now you th there are tools that can help you respond on the fly to propose language that you may get from the other side suppose you know they push back on a limitation of liability and you have a standard response to a certain amount that's being that's proposed well with the click of button you can respond back and say hey all right we don't like this amount but how about this amount instead and that again that can just be sent off to the other side and they can respond accordingly so it's sort of these individual elements that can be automated that ordinarily would take you time to think about and respond to and write the proper way can now be done through the through the beauty of technology and some of these document management tools. Yeah, it's no, that's really great. Um, I want to also remind our audience that, that's watching us live. Uh, if you do have questions for Colin or questions for Rachel, um, go ahead, post them in the comments, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube or LinkedIn, we can see them all here um, and we'd be happy to answer your questions. Um, so. Colin, the, the future of, of what we're talking about here is letting the computer do the work for you, right? Machine learning, artificial intelligence. Rachel, you've talked about some of the things um, when you and I spoke earlier that, that the team is looking into. Let's dive into that and, and what this evolves into once we see mass adoption of this type of technology. Uh, Colin, why don't we start with you and kind of where you see this going? Yeah, I mean... You know, first, let me just say at the outset, um, robots are not coming to take your job. They're not coming to uh, replace you. They are not uh, coming to kind of take over society. So let's just get that out there. Uh, I would say in terms of where we're going with technology, uh, certainly more and more automation of drafting, of reviewing, of responding to um, requests, to document edits, to that type of thing. We definitely move in that direction thanks to machine learning and association with natural language processing, which kind of work in hand in hand to respond to these types of things. So we're certainly moving more in that direction. Um, I think we're also moving more in the direction of 
kind of automatically just, you know, executing different types of agreements, assuming that they meet your standards, things along those lines. Um, and perhaps even we're at the point now where, you know, a certain type of agreement, you just don't have to really even touch at all. You just, you know, it's completely out of your hands. It just is completely handled by, um, by machine learning uh, and natural language processing. Um, so, you know, I think that's where we're, where we're going. Um, in some cases, we're at just the sort of almost at the gates of that. Um, but that's, that's, I would say, where we're, where we're heading towards. Um, I tend to take a little bit of a slower, less dramatic, less sort of transformative view of, of technologies because I think it's, it's important to be realistic about the state of the legal profession and where it's going and lawyers' notorious resistance to change and to adoption of tech. But that being said, that even though their resistance remains strong, technology is not waiting for the resistance to die down. Technology is continuing to advance. And I think those lawyers that are best positioned to survive will be those that are more apt to take advantage of those technological advances. Rachel, do you have any thoughts here? Yeah, I know that um, you know, as far as Docrio and Litify is concerned, you know, we're really looking at advancing some of the operational things that um, lawyers or case managers do on a day to day basis using technology. You know, we talked earlier about um, organizing and cataloging your documents as they come into the system, you know, taking that doc assign product a little bit further so that leveraging OCR, we can use machine learning and AI stuff to catalog and categorize that document for you so you don't ever have to touch it not only once it comes into the system, but then it automatically ends up where it's supposed to go because it's read, you know, the part, the name of the individual involved in the case or something was able to capture some detail about the case and so put the document where it needed to go. Um, additionally, you know, during that document generation, um, part of the process, building in some automation there so that once a document gets created, depending on some certain things that might have been put into that document, you know, it's sent out for review or it skips the review process, you know, a little bit of those things here and there, not necessarily to, um, you know, take away the job of a lawyer, but just to, um, you know, operationally improve their day and get them away from doing some of those little things that, you know, one task takes you a second, two seconds, but you build those up and that's your entire day of just filing and sending out documents for review and things like that. So trying to improve those things where we can. Yeah, it sounds like the the evolution of what happens in a law firm, right? Yeah. The, the, the lawyer should be focusing on, you know, what, what their skill set mm -hmm. actually is, right? Yeah. And then the, the people who are working around the office, um, their job is changing. We've talked about some of the ways that that's happening. Um, what role do you think a, a, a powerful document management system can play in extracting and actioning on some of these key insights from the agreements, right? Once you actually understand what the data has surfaced to you, what do you do with that data? Where are some of the, the operational efficiencies, as we've said, that you will see around um, around the law firm? Yeah, I think uh, a number of different areas. One is you can see, um, you can potentially get metrics on sort of how long it takes you to review a certain type of agreement, how often you've used a certain type of clause, um, how many agreements tend to have this type of payment term or this type of renewal date? Um, how many agreements tend to um, have this type of limitation of liability or this type of indemnification? All those little bits of data that you can then develop reports around and then that can help kind of put your agreements in your business in context and understand, all right, I've got all these agreements, I've done all this work, here's where things stand and, that, and then based on that reporting, you can then determine whether your agreements actually are serving the purpose that you wanted them to serve, or in fact, whether they need to be revised because they're either slowing your business down or they're getting too much pushback from your customers, um, or you're accepting too many payment terms that are having a, a negative impact on your bottom line and on your quarterly or, or monthly or yearly metrics. And how do you see firms um, pushing the adoption of this type of technology, right? It's it's a big step to go from, you know, the, and I've got one right here, right? my legal pad, right? I write down all my notes in my legal pad. How do you see these firms um, improving the adoption of digital document technology? Yeah, so one of the big ways that you get adoption, and, and this is gonna be 
something not everyone wants to hear because it's hard to overcome, but it's culture. You have to build a culture that is supportive of this type of technology and that is not just supportive, but welcoming of, of this type of tool. Um, and that comes from education. That from, comes from showing using data itself that, hey, if we do it this way, here's how much time we're spending versus if we do it this way, here's how much time we're spending. And by reducing that inefficiency, then you can say, oh, well, now I have more time to spend with this client or that client or even bring on a new client because this client that usually takes me a lot of time to deal with, I don't necessarily have to deal with as much. Um, of course, by saying that, someone at a firm would then say, well, actually, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because we use a bill wow, so why should we shift our time away when we're rewarded for spending a lot of time on on different things? And and I think the other part of it is that, quite frankly, the bill wow model, you know, misaligns incentives in that, you know, it forces lawyers and induces them to not actually work necessarily for the clients, but work for the firm. And I think that by shifting that mindset around, you can make the firm be more client friendly. And frankly, the clients may benefit from having lawyers that are more knowledgeable and giving them more business oriented advice based off the data that they can get from these technologies. And I think if you approach it from that kind of pragmatic way, as opposed to saying, hey, well, you're just doing this wrong, you should use this tool, I think you'll be better off kind of getting an adoption. But so it's, it's really in two parts. It's the culture part, and it's the education part, and they work hand in hand to help allow for broader adoption of tech. But you know, you have to be patient, and you have to meet people where they are. You can't just kind of force a tool upon people, and you also have to understand how the users are going to be using the tool. You know, how do they currently operate? Are they okay with using a different tool? Are they, you know, what are their concerns? And try to address those concerns by one by one before you go about and bring a new tool on board, because you have to have buy-in and have support and have users wanting to actually use the tool. Otherwise, you're going to have this tool that's expensive and no one's going to use it, which doesn't do anyone any good. Yep. Um, I think we could spend a whole nother 30 <laughs> minutes or an hour or two hours talking about um, alternative billing models in the legal industry. We most certainly could. <laughs> mutually aligning interests of, right. uh, of client and attorney. Um, but it does expose something, right? If, if what you're doing is not in the best interest of, of the client and really focused on the client outcome, then you should reevaluate what you're doing because your, your sustainability um, is potentially at risk. For sure. Um, so there's there's a lot that can be gained from leveraging the data from your documents, right? Whether it's um, searching, whether it's automation, whether it's you know some of the, the the future things that we've spoken about. What do you recommend that the first step is that um, a firm or an organization take? Um, if today they are, you know, they're behind the eight ball and everything they're doing is, um, let's just say it's either in paper or it's, uh, a, you know, one step further and just scanned in. So my, I have a common model, people process than tech. So I think you start with your people, you understand how they work, what their concerns are, what their pain points are, understand your processes, how your people fit into those processes, what the pain points are. Uh, what the inefficiencies are, and then based off of those two knowledge bases, then look at tools that can help solve for those specific pain points. Because you have to understand your problem before you start searching for solutions. You don't want to look for solutions and then be in search of a problem afterwards. That's a backwards way of doing it. Um, so really, you have to understand your people, understand your processes, and then look for the tech that can help suit your you solve for those problems. And oftentimes, the, the problems that ha that are to be solved can be a combination of both process of proven and tech. So don't expect tech to solve all of your problems, but you can certainly expect tech to help solve some of your problems. So that's another important point is to understand that tech is not a panacea. It can only, it, it's but one set of tools, but it's a powerful set of tools. And that's why it's important to understand what your problems are before you start looking at tech as a solution. Yeah, that's actually very wise advice um, <laughs> and, and very related, relatable to what we're talking about today, because if you don't know what you're trying to extract data wise from your documents, you may go ahead and capture the wrong information up front. So it's very important to think about what the reports are going to look like, what the automation is going to look like in your end state, and then build your system or customize your system appropriately exactly. to be able to capture that at the beginning. Um, 
Rachel, uh, you obviously talk to our customers on a regular basis. What have you seen on, on the, the adoption side? How are firms kind of taking the step to leveraging um, digitized documents? Well, I mean, they love it. <laughs> Who doesn't love a digitized document? Um, they just like how it puts everything at their fingertips in a much more usable, they're already spending time on their computers, especially today. I mean, the three of us are all at home and the only way we have is to communicate through our computers and things. So um, I would say that in the last four to five months, there's been a huge adoption of it even more so because it's the only way to communicate right now with the outside world. So it's been very helpful in that sense, but also just, they're already spending their time on their computer. So getting the documents there, getting them where they're already working um, helps with adoption drastically. Yeah, um, you're keeping people in less systems, right? Mm -hmm. When we're talking about adoption, um, you know, the the old way of, of managing documents, right? You have to go to the physical filing cabinet, mm -hmm. pull the document, right? It existed on your desk and nowhere else. Right. Um, and hopefully it was in the right folder, right? <laughs> now. Now we're, you know, we've evolved, um, you know, over, over the past decade, it's now the documents exist digitally in a box.com or a Dropbox, right? Or a, um, or a Google drive or on your hard drive. Um, and now the, kind of this evolution has been fusing your document generation and your document management and the system that you're actually keeping and referencing the document. So R Rachel, you mind talking just a little bit about how you've gone ahead and kind of taken that experience and, and really pushed into just one user experience? Sure, so um, everything for, I, I can speak about it, you know, in terms of DocRio. And so everything mm -hmm. with DocRio lives and breathes inside of Salesforce. You never have to go into any other system. Um, from the moment you, you know, sync the document into the system, it's within DocRio, which is within Salesforce. So it's still one system that you're in. When you go to create your template and your packet to, you know, do your document generation, again, it's within DocRio, which is within Salesforce. So you're still working within the same system that you're already in. And then once you create that document, it's already attached to your case, attached to the parties that you're working with, the clients that you're working with, again, within DocRio, within Salesforce. The entire process from, you know, document generation and creating that document to then having that document and referencing and uh, bringing it up and showing it to a client or downloading it or whatever, it's all within DocRio, all within Salesforce. So it's one system across the board. You never have to leave it. You never have to reference anything else. Um, it's just one system, <laughs> which makes yeah. it super easy to use. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. Um, one system to learn, one system to manage. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, yeah, sorry. No, I was just going to say, definitely helps with adoption. Yeah, it does, so. for sure. Um, okay. Um, you know, Colin, um, be before we sign off here, um, is there something that, that you think that we should cover that we didn't address during our conversation? Uh, I think it was a really great Great chat. I would just simply say uh, to folks out there thinking about um, their documents and, and getting data from them that, um, you know, do your research, understand your people, understand your processes, understand your documents, um, you know, take the time to do that due diligence before looking um, at a technologically, uh, be at a technology uh, based solution, but uh, technology can really help you uh, bring a lot of value to your apartment. So I would not underestimate it. And I would really strongly encourage you, um, you all to investigate possible ways to uh, look at tech and how tech can get data out of your agreements. Because I, as I said in my LinkedIn post that prompted this whole conversation, um, you're likely sitting on a gold mine of possible useful actionable data. And it's really important to not just let it sit there, but actually uh, understand it, take advantage of it and use it. And if um, people who are watching today live or they're watching this recording after the fact, they want to get a hold of you, they want to follow you, they want to hire you, where can they go? <laughs> sure. Uh, so my website is uh, www.colinslevy.com. I also am quite active on Twitter, uh, clevy underscore law. I'm also on LinkedIn, pretty active, so it's pretty easy for me to, uh, for you to find me. Um, definitely reach out. Happy to have a chat. Um, happy to collaborate. So uh, strongly encourage you all to reach out if you have questions or simply want to chat. I, I, I love chatting and meeting new folks. Th thank you very much for, for joining us today.
those of you watching, it's, it's a great follow. I would add them to your list, uh, produces some great content. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us today as well. Uh, and cool. thank you everybody for watching us um, here on Liticast. You can watch uh, the full episode if you joined us in the middle of the episode on litify.com slash Liticast um, or read the recap there as well. We got some great episodes coming up um, on Thursday. We've got episodes next week. Um, so keep a lookout on our calendar. Again, litify.com slash Liticast. Um, you could watch us LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook. Uh, until next time, we will see you soon. Take care. Thank you. Thanks.